Engine and belt noises. Is there a week that goes by without you having these types of problems to diagnose? And while this work can be frustrating, following a few simple steps can make the job a lot easier. Welcome to Videotech. This month, we'll examine the causes of engine and belt noise and introduce a plan of attack to help you isolate and solve the problem. We'll also demonstrate solutions to some of the problems that you're likely to face. But first, let's look at how noise is created. If you could see sound, it would look like the waves created when a rock is thrown into the pond. The length of one complete sound wave is called its period. When a sound wave's period equals one second, it has a frequency of one hertz. Most humans are capable of hearing sounds in the range of 20 to 20,000 complete waves per second, or 20 to 20,000 hertz. The number of waves per second necessary to create a particular sound is called its frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher pitch the resulting sound. Now, if you were to throw that same rock into the pond with more force, you would create taller waves. The height of the wave is called its amplitude. With sound waves, the greater the amplitude, the louder the sound. These sound waves are generated by vibrations, which cause waves in the air that surrounds us. When I speak, my vocal cords vibrate to create sound. Your television has a speaker which vibrates to reproduce my voice. There are dozens of moving parts in an engine, and most vibrate at one frequency or another. When you stop to think about it, it's pretty amazing that engines aren't noisier. That engines aren't as loud as they used to be is no accident. Engineers are continually trying to find ways to lessen vehicle noise. One way of doing this is to force unavoidable vibrations to frequencies above or below the range of human hearing. One of the simplest ways of stopping noise is through the use of barriers by placing an object between the driver and the source of noise. Much of it can be eliminated. But some noises are transmitted by the vehicle itself when its body or frame is allowed to vibrate. To combat this, the vehicle designers use insulation and dampeners. Insulation like floor matting absorbs sound waves before they can reach our ears. And dampeners, such as engine mounts, isolate vibrations and prevent them from spreading to the vehicle's body. Even with all the attempts to soundproof vehicles, problems still occur. How you approach the problem will have a lot to do with your success in solving them. In tackling engine and belt noise, it's a good idea to use the six-step troubleshooting procedure used in servicing other areas of the vehicle. The first step is to verify the customer's complaint. This is usually done by the service advisor but can be difficult as some of the noises we'll be covering occur only under specific conditions. Say when the vehicle is cold. This might require leaving the vehicle overnight before the complaint can be verified and properly diagnosed. In other instances, it may be necessary to take the vehicle on a road test with the owner in order to completely understand the problem. Whether you are able to verify the problem or not, you'll need to check for other symptoms that might be related to the problem. These symptoms need to be written down for the technician's use. This can be done on the log sheet included in the reference book that accompanies this video. The log sheet will help service advisors provide technicians with the type of information necessary for accurate diagnosis. Don't forget to ask about other problems or symptoms, even though the customer may feel that they are unrelated. If the person bringing the vehicle in for service is not the one who normally drives the car, it may be necessary to use the phone and call the principal driver for more information. This is especially true in cases where you've been unable to duplicate the customer's complaint. Any information you can get regarding the problem will make servicing the vehicle easier. The next step in the troubleshooting process 
is to analyze the symptoms that have been recorded. If you've been successful in reproducing the noise that is the source of the customer complaint, you'll need to determine if the noise is really a problem or a normal condition that the customer may not be familiar with. Let's look at some examples. Power steering systems are a source of many customer complaints, yet the hissing sound produced at each end of the system's travel is normal. It is caused by the pressure relief valve releasing fluid. The electric fan may be a cause of concern to vehicle owners not accustomed to this feature. The low humming from the engine compartment, especially when the vehicle is stopped in traffic on hot days, doesn't sound normal to them. The same can be said of the slight whine produced by vehicles with overhead cams and timing belts. In each of these cases, explaining the system involved and its advantages will go a long way in promoting customer satisfaction. Some normal sounds are vehicle specific and it's important that you are familiar with them. Cherokee models with the four-wheel anti-lock brake system produce some sounds that are different from other vehicles. A low intermittent humming sound can be heard in the engine compartment, especially after repeated braking. This is caused by the system's pump motor maintaining the required brake fluid pressure. Customers with good ears may also note a clicking immediately after the vehicle has started. These are the ABS solenoids being engaged as part of the system's self-test. Both of these conditions are normal. Customers with 1991 2.5-liter engines may notice injector noise that was not present on earlier throttle body fuel systems. The performance advantage provided by the fuel injectors more than makes up for the small increase in engine noise. The 4-liter engine produces somewhat more valve train noise than some customers may be used to. This is due to Jeep's use of a fabricated stainless steel exhaust manifold which improves the horsepower of this engine. And Eagle Talon drivers who have never driven a turbocharged vehicle before may not be familiar with the sound that it produces. Make sure that the customer understands the real advantages provided by each of these systems so that they don't feel that their concerns were ignored. They all do that is not an acceptable answer, even if it is correct. But what if the sound isn't normal and the vehicle has some type of real problem? This is where the fourth step, isolating the problem, comes in. Although engine and belt noise are often lumped together, they really are two different subjects. Let's look at engine noise first. If you've determined that the noise is in the engine and the cause isn't obvious upon your initial inspection, it's time for a more detailed examination. This needs to be done before you start a time-consuming search for the problem inside of the engine. Check the vehicle's oil. Low oil levels will cause a great deal of valve train noise and can eventually lead to engine failure. An engine that is overfilled can also be noisy and end up damaged. Also, check the power steering and transmission fluid levels where applicable. Remove the negative battery cable and inspect the belts for damage and make sure that all engine mounts are in place and appear serviceable. Then, reconnect the battery. Start the engine and check for smooth operation of the belts and correct alignment of the pulleys. Use extreme caution any time you are inspecting an engine that is operating. Look for excessive amounts of engine movement, especially under heavy throttle. This is a sign of damaged engine mounts, which can cause considerable noise. Finally, check the oil pressure with the mechanical gauge. With the engine off, remove the oil pressure sensor and install the gauge. Then, start the engine. Consult your service manual for the recommended oil pressure. Readings outside of the specified range could be a sign of a failed oil pump, main bearing damage, or 
clogged oil passages. If the steps we've just gone through haven't identified the problem, it's time to determine exactly where in the engine the sound is coming from. A mechanic's stethoscope is the tool you'll need to use. Let's divide the engine into zones to help focus in on the source of the engine noise. The lower portion of the engine houses the crankshaft, connecting rod bearings, and the engine's main bearings are the components that, if damaged, can produce noise down here. The main bearing noise can be very subtle. Damaged connecting rod bearings generally produce a loud knock when accelerating or climbing a hill. You can further isolate rod knock using an engine diagnostic analyzer to kill cylinders one at a time. This removes the load from the cylinder. When the knock seems to double, you found the cylinder with connecting rod bearing problems. This procedure is similar to the old method of pulling spark plug wires. Because of the high voltage ignition systems and electronic modules found on today's vehicles, that method should no longer be used. Should a damaged bearing be found, don't forget to carefully inspect the corresponding crankshaft journal for damage. Otherwise, replacing the bearings may not solve the problem. As we move to the engine's midsection, piston and combustion noises become the cause of concern. Piston slap usually occurs when an engine is cold. The skirt of the piston has too much free play in the cylinder bore, allowing the piston to wobble and knock. Once the engine is warmed up, the piston can expand to an acceptable size, and the engine might run quietly. This situation can be almost impossible to diagnose unless the engine is cold. Piston scuffing can occur when the piston is too large for the cylinder bore or when a piston pin locks up, causing the piston to be cocked in the cylinder. In each case, the body of the piston repeatedly makes contact with the cylinder wall. Unlike piston slap, this knocking sound usually increases when the engine is warm. This will eventually lead to excessive wear of the piston, the cylinder bore, or both. A cylinder bore that is not within specification can also cause a knocking sound and will eventually damage the piston. And don't forget about the piston pin. Free play here can also produce engine knock. Engine knock, caused by too much free play at the piston pin, will usually stop when the cylinder is killed using an engine diagnostic analyzer. Don't allow a vehicle to run for an extended period of time with a cylinder not firing. Raw fuel in the exhaust can damage a catalytic converter. Detonation can also be a source of knocking in the cylinders. In this situation, there are two explosions. One is caused by the spark plug igniting the air-fuel mixture. In the second explosion, a portion of the compressed air-fuel mixture explodes before the normal flame front reaches it. This creates high-frequency pressure waves in the cylinder. The effect on the piston is comparable to a heavy blow from a hammer. Two simple causes of detonation are incorrect ignition timing and the use of fuels with too low an anti-knock value. A third cause is carbon buildup in the combustion chamber. Should a large buildup occur, compression increases beyond the point for which the engine is designed and detonation becomes more likely. For the engine to run properly, the carbon deposits will have to be removed. Valve train components are found at the top of the engine and because of their complexity are a common source of engine noise. Tappets, also known as lash adjusters or hydraulic lifters, can be a source of noise in this area should they fail. Rocker arms, valves, and push rods on vehicles without overhead cams also need to be considered. Each of these can produce a ticking sound when damaged or worn. Use the stethoscope to determine as closely as possible where the sound is coming from. The electronic models allow you to pinpoint problems with even greater accuracy. To inspect valve train components, turn off the engine and remove the cylinder head cover. Carefully inspect the components in that area for wear or damage to determine the source of the problem. A noise coming from the front of the engine is likely being produced by a stretched or worn timing chain. 
If this is the case, it may have to be replaced. Consult the service manual for the proper procedure, as this varies with each engine. On models with timing belts, noise from this area could be a sign of a damaged belt or incorrect tension. Please note that the timing belts can fail prematurely should they be removed from the vehicle and installed so that they rotate in the opposite direction. To avoid this, mark the direction of rotation on all belts you plan to reinstall. The manifold can also be a source of engine noise. Exhaust noise from this area is usually a sign of gasket damage. A cracked manifold can produce a ticking sound as one of the cylinders it serves fires. This often disappears once the vehicle is warmed up. Technical Service Bulletin 11-51-91 refers specifically to this as it occurs on Jeep's 4-liter engine. Belt-driven accessories like the power steering pump, air conditioning compressor, and alternator can also produce sounds other than those caused by the belt. Bearing failure in any of these components will also create a noise problem. Low fluid in the power steering pump will increase steering noise and effort. A cut O-ring seal on the valve spool can create a loud squawking sound. Belt noise is something familiar to all technicians and is a clear sign that there is a problem somewhere in the accessory drive system. There are two types of belts used on Jeep and Eagle vehicles. The first is the traditional V-belt that we are all familiar with. These are especially well suited to accessory systems as they are somewhat forgiving. That is, the belts will tolerate a certain amount of pulley misalignment. Serpentine belts are being found on more and more Jeep and Eagle vehicles, and for good reason. Some of the advantages serpentine belts have over V-belts include easier service, longer life, quieter operation, and greater load capacity for today's accessory-laden vehicles. With these belts, however, correct pulley alignment is critical. The sources of belt noise are usually pretty simple to determine. A belt that is worn or damaged will often be a source of noise. A careful visual inspection is usually all it takes to uncover problems here. As a safety precaution, remove the battery's negative cable before handling drive belts. Look for cracked or glazed areas on V-belts. Glazing is caused by the heat generated as the belt slides in the pulleys. Because glazing hardens the belt, it becomes more likely to crack. On both types of belts, look for separation or delamination. Serpentine belts will often have small cracks running across the rib surface of the belt. These are considered normal and not a reason to replace the belt. However, cracks running along the belt ribs are not normal and the belt will have to be replaced. Check the sides of the belt for signs of rubbing against pulleys or stationary engine parts. If you should find a damaged belt on a vehicle, be sure to determine what caused the damage before installing a new belt. Otherwise, you haven't really solved the problem. Make sure that belts and pulleys are free of contaminants, such as oil, paint, or antifreeze. They can shorten belt life and prevent proper belt contact with the pulleys. Examine pulleys to determine if they are damaged or out of alignment. Look for uneven wear and polished edges on pulleys as a clue that pulley alignment is incorrect. In this example, the pulley has walked out on the rubber sleeve of the vibration damper. This would cause serious pulley misalignment and would be noticeable, only through careful examination. Sometimes it's easier to spot alignment problems with the engine running. Take care to stand well back of any moving components. Pulleys should always be within the same plane and not show signs of wobble. Some of the most critical spots for pulley alignment are where two pulleys are close to each other. Because belts are more forgiving over greater distances, these tend to be the sources of most misalignment and noise problems. Correct belt tension is important. A belt that is too loose can create quite a bit of noise while one that is too tight may break 
or cause premature failure of the components it is driving. Use a belt tension gauge to make sure that each belt is properly adjusted to the tension recommended in the service manual. Do not measure tension at the belt splice mark. Also, be aware that there are different tension recommendations for new and used belts. On vehicles with multiple belts, sounds can often be isolated by removing belts one at a time until the noise stops. Examine that belt and the components it drives for noise producing damage. Removing and replacing drive belts for diagnosis or repair is relatively easy, but proper care must be taken to make sure that the job is done right. Be sure to disconnect the negative battery cable before working on belts. On Jeep and Eagle vehicles, belt tension is controlled by one of the driven accessories or an adjustable idler pulley. This varies depending on the engine and equipment. In each case, the pulley that regulates tension uses several bolts to maintain proper positioning. To remove a belt, loosen the pivot and locking bolts for the accessory or pulley. Then back off the adjusting bolt until the belt can be removed. Jeep power steering pumps use two additional locking bolts at the back of the pump to keep it firmly in position. To remove belts from some vehicles, engine damping and support brackets may have to be removed. Once you have removed the dry belt from the engine, inspect pulleys for damage that was not visible with the belt in place. Check for damaged bearings and excessive free play. If everything is functioning properly, you are ready to install the new belt. Place the new belt in position, making sure that it is routed properly. Belt routing diagrams are included in the service manual and in the reference book that comes with this video. There may also be a diagram mounted in the vehicle's engine compartment. Once the belt has been routed, tighten the adjusting bolt to set belt tension. Use the belt tension gauge or the deflection method to determine when you have reached the proper level. Finally, tighten the pivot and locking bolts to hold the pulley in place. Components on the 5.9 liter and Mitsubishi engines may not have adjusting bolts for setting tensions. In these cases, a pry bar must be used to lever the component. Use caution to only apply force in the area recommended in the service manual. You should never pry against the pulley itself. The power steering reservoir is another area to which pressure should never be applied because damage to internal components can result. Once the installation of the belt has been completed, reconnect the battery cable and run the engine for a few moments. As a safety precaution, remove the battery's negative cable before handling drive belts. Then, recheck belt tension. This is a step that shouldn't be skipped, as many belts may not be completely seated until the engine has been operated. Let's use the steps we've discussed to repair a Wrangler that came back to the dealership with a complaint about an engine noise. The service advisor was able to verify that there was indeed an engine noise and has completed the log sheet noting the related symptoms. It's clear that this isn't a normal sound for this engine. A closer inspection is needed. Be sure to check for proper fluid levels and measure the engine's oil pressure. If everything checks out okay, it's time to use a stethoscope to pinpoint the source of the problem. The tapping sound is loudest in the top half of the engine, toward the front of the vehicle. The sound doesn't seem to be influenced by engine load, so piston problems can probably be ruled out. The only way left to find the problem is to go in for a closer look. Disconnect the negative battery cable and the ventilation hoses before removing the cylinder head cover. Carefully inspect the components for damage or wear. These appear to be okay. That would suggest that the tappets may be the source of the noise. To access the tappets, 
the two cap screws at the bridge and pivot assembly must be removed. Alternate loosening each screw one turn at a time so as to not damage the bridge. Remove the bridge, pivots, rocker arms, and push rods and place them on your bench in the order removed so that they can be returned to their original positions. Check for damage that might not have been visible when the parts were assembled. To determine if push rods have been bent, roll them on a flat surface. They should not wobble. Bent rods will have to be replaced, but only after the cause of the damage has been determined and repaired. These rods are fine. Use the special tappet removal tool to lift the tappets out of the push rod openings in the cylinder head. On overhead cam vehicles, the tappet or lash adjuster is mounted in a cavity in the rocker arm. On both types of engines, if the tappet shows signs of wear, it's important to also examine the camshaft lobe for damage. In this case, the tappet isn't showing signs of wear. Be sure to keep track of the tappets once they have been removed so they can be returned to their original positions. Next, remove the snap ring and inspect tappet components for damage or a buildup of sludge or varnish. This one is damaged and will have to be replaced. The remaining tappets should be inspected and cleaned. Replace any tappets you find to be damaged. Dip tappets into Mopar engine oil supplement prior to installation in the engine. There is no need to charge the tappet with oil as this will happen quickly once the engine is started. Use the special tool to install the tappet into position. If you are not installing a new tappet, install the tappet into the same bore that it was originally in. Return the push rods to their original locations, lubricating their ball ends with Mopar engine oil supplement. Return the rocker arms, bridge and pivot assemblies to their original locations. Loosely install the cap screws that hold the bridge in place. Alternately tighten these screws one turn at a time to avoid damaging the bridge. Then tighten them to 19 foot-pounds of torque. Pour what is left of the Mopar engine oil supplement over the entire valve actuating assembly. This additive must remain with the engine oil for at least 1,000 miles. Wipe clean the cylinder head sealing surfaces and the seal on the cylinder head cover. Inspect the seal to be sure that it isn't damaged. Repairs to the seal can be made with RTV. Be sure to let it cure completely before installation. Install the cylinder head cover, tightening the mounting bolts to 70 inch pounds of torque. Attach the crankcase ventilation hoses and reconnect the negative battery cable. Finally, verify proper operation of the vehicle. That does it for this month's topic. Follow the steps we've used to make diagnosing belt and engine noise a little easier. For more information on engine service, consider the courses offered through the Chrysler Corporation Training Centers. There, you'll have the opportunity to gain hands-on experience servicing the engines found in Jeep and Eagle vehicles. We'll see you next time on Videotech.